Fantastic. Well, hello and a very warm welcome from us all to everyone joining us today. I'm Camille Richmond, Marketing Manager for Sage Psychology. We are absolutely delighted to be hosting this webinar, the first in a series from us. Driven by the belief that social and behavioural science has the power to improve society, we at SAGE are proud to produce high quality educational resources that support instructors to prepare the citizens, policy makers, educators and researchers of the future. Today is really about celebrating the publication of Ginny and Victoria's new book, Thematic Analysis, A Practical Guide. Ginny and Victoria conceptualise their approach as a journey and more importantly, an adventure. And to quote from their new book, you need to be psychologically ready for a rich, unexpected, sometimes frustrating, but ultimately achievable adventure. With that in mind, this book really is the definitive guide to TA, highly practical with a step-by-step -step approach, answers to commonly asked questions and a rich bank of accompanying online resources packed with useful learning and teaching tools. On behalf of the entire team at Sage Psychology, editor Amy and assistant editor Esme, production editor Rachel and everyone else involved in the book, we'd like to thank Ginny and Victoria. We are honoured to have published not just this book, but also their award-winning and best-selling successful qualitative research. We are delighted to let you know that we have stock of thematic analysis via our website. For those of you who've already ordered copies, copies, they will be with you soon. If you've yet to order a copy, we will be sharing a one-off discount during the webinar, which will be valid until the end of the year. If you're happy to, please leave a review to share your thoughts on the book. These are really so helpful for others to see. We are fortunate today to have a fantastic panel of speakers joining us. Ginny and Victoria joined by Nikki and Gareth, with whom they work closely and who also contributed to their latest book. Um, just wanted to do some quick introductions. So Ginny Brown is a professor in the School of Psychology at the University of Auckland, a feminist and critical psychologist. She teaches around gender and psychology and critical health psychology at undergraduate and graduate levels. When time allows, her research explores the intersecting areas of gender, bodies, sex and sexuality, health, and now food. Ginny was recently awarded this year's Marsden Medal by the New Zealand Association of Scientists in recognition of her global impact on the development of qualitative empirical methods and for the generosity of spirit she expresses through this work. Victoria Clark is an Associate Professor in Qualitative and Critical Psychology in the Department of Health and Social Scientists, Sciences sorry, at the University of the West of England, where she teaches about qualitative methods and gender and sexuality and supervises student research on a variety of undergraduate and postgraduate programmes. She has conducted research in the intersecting areas of gender and sexuality, family and relationships, and appearance and embodiment. Ginny and Victoria's first co-authored publication came in 2006 via a groundbreaking paper, which has since been cited over 100,000 times. Since then, they have gone on to write an award-winning and best-selling textbook, successful qualitative research and numerous chapters, editorials, commentaries and encyclopedia entries on TA, as well as working together on various research and publishing projects. Nikki Hayfield is currently a senior lecturer in social psychology and leader of the identities, subjectivities and inequalities research theme at the University of the West of England. She is a social psychologist whose research interests are in sexualities. She uses qualitative methods of data collection and analysis and has written with others about TA. And finally, Gareth Terry is a senior lecturer at Auckland University of Technology. He likes exploring the various ways bodies intersect with the social, especially why different bodies and practices are privileged over others. His current work focuses on disability, rehabilitation and how access is constituted drawing on critical theory and qualitative research. We look forward to having an engaging and lively discussion on thematic analysis with lots of contributions from you, our viewers. You can submit questions by the Q&A function and you can also upvote the questions that you'd like to see answered. So thank you once again for joining us. Um, Ginny and Victoria, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, me for that lovely um, introduction and hello to everyone who is 
here. Good morning. If you're in a part of the world, which is the part of the world that I'm in, good evening. If you're in the part of the world that Victoria and Nikki are in, uh, Gareth is also in this part of the world with me. Um, good afternoon. Good middle of the day. Uh, we are delighted um, and surprised and excited um, to see so many people registered from so many different countries and um, like uh, likely you all come from a wide range of disciplines um, and a whole host of different experiences and practices and positions and expertise and so on. So uh, welcome to you all. Um, for anyone who's watching um, in Aotearoa, uh, Morena, kia ora. Um, and we really want to sort of set this up as um, a introduction to the book and an engagement with the sorts of questions that you have and so on. But um, we won't be able to answer everything. You know, we are both um, psychologists um, and not just psychologists about everything, quite sort of specialised um, gender, sexuality, qualitative health, psychology people. And so some of the questions, um, if they're very specific and they're outside our disciplinary area, we may have to give you a pre-warning that um, we, we, you might leave disappointed. But um, maybe someone else in the Q&A will be able to answer your question <laughs> if you have one. So um, I encourage some, um, some interactivity on that front. Um, so we will try to do what we can with the questions. We've had quite a few that have come through um, in response to the calls out on Twitter um, and just general ones that have come into SAGE as well. So um, we really look forward to having this conversation. And uh, it'll be free flowing and hopefully the tech will behave and it will be our friend and we will um, look forward to enjoying um, that. So I'm going to hand over to Nikki, who is going to start the questions. Basically, Nikki and Gareth are going to um, take the lead in asking questions of us at different points in time. And we have asked them to be kind and gentle with us um, mm -hmm. as they go through that. So thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Jenny. Welcome, Jenny and Victoria. Fantastic news on the book being published. Congratulations. Um, I guess the first thing that people might be interested to know is just a little bit about the book, um, what you're hoping readers might get from it, um, why this book at this point. So a multiple question to get you started. <laughs> Shall I start with this one, Jen? Um, so why the book? Well, I think one thing that is really interesting about writing a paper that's very popular is that you become sort of fixed in time. So we become um, Brown and Clark, it's pronounced Brown rather than Braun, as people always say. Um, we become um, Brown and Clark 2006, and that's how people think about this method. It was articulated, that's it, boom. But our ideas have evolved, our thinking has evolved through things like teaching. Ginny in particular has kind of traveled all around the world doing teaching, and we get asked lots of questions, and that prompts us to think and reflect. And that means our ideas have evolved. So we really wanted to write a book that captured that evolution in thinking about how our ideas have kind of progressed and changed over the years. And we also got the strong sense from people that the paper wasn't enough, that although the paper was useful and interesting, people still wanted more detail, people had questions. And so that thought was evolved into, why don't we write a book? And um, so I saw someone ask a question about the audience. We kind of, when you start writing a textbook, you imagine that you're writing for students primarily because they're the primary audience of a textbook. But through the process of writing, we realise that isn't just our audience. Our audience is really diverse from really experienced academics who are perhaps new to qualitative research or TA. So we tried to write a book that speaks to everyone. And the book takes you through the process of doing a TA in the first part. So it kind of gives you the basics of the process but reflecting the kind of evolutions in our thinking. And then the second part kind of expands on that by giving you lots of detail around the process. So there's a chapter on theory, there's a chapter on interpretation, and there's a chapter that also contextualizes our approach to TA in relation to all the other, well, not all the other approaches, but quite a few of the other approaches that exist out there. So you can just focus on section one and that gives you a good, um, 
account of the process or you can also engage with section two and that gives you the, that kind of expanded lens so hopefully it speaks to everyone that is interested in ta but you know that's that's a quite a lofty goal and we may not have pulled it off I think I would I would um, just add to that that it, it led to some really um, interesting conversations as we were going through and figuring out um, how the book would work and we had to you know we grappled with um, how that how we would organize the book I think we had about four or five different iterations of um, where the chapters were and the the final book looks nothing like um, our earlier versions you know we moved things around we started with you know some of the material around theory and what we ended up doing I think was kind of going okay so how can we balance the speaking to these different audiences in the in the scope of a book which has a word length and it might seem like quite a big book but it is um, a remarkably shortened version of the book we initially <laughs> produced um, and, and and so there was kind of like a, a really kind of um, deliberate balancing act and trying to figure out how can you how can you hold different audiences through a book like this, through a textbook, which, which really has to sort of engage in some very kind of um, clear entry level kind of descriptions of things and also try to grapple with some much more complex ideas and, and so on. And um, yeah, the, the, we, I do not know how many words we produced and how many words went to word heaven in this process of writing this book, but there were quite a few of them. We've got a related question as well around how you think the book should be used. So do you think it should be kind of read from cover to cover? Um, should it be dipped into or are there bits you should read and then dip in and out of? So how do you envisage people using the book? Um, we do actually tell people how to read it in the first chapter because we're such control freaks. We wanted to frame your engagement with this book. So we do kind of, we do have suggestions in, see, I'm not gonna be able to remember the contents. Write a book, forget the contents. Um, I've got a copy beside me so I can make sure I get this right. Um, so we've got in the first scene setting chapter, we have a section called Mapped Adventure Pathways, navigating your way through the book. So we suggest kind of how different audiences might want to read it and engage it. So engage with it so we suggest you know there might be some dipping in and out for some audiences there might be really cover to cover so it's it's um it's designed for you to engage with it in the way that works for you and I think that's a really good echo of of how we think about reflexive TA is we're not sort of handing you a recipe that you have to follow and we'll be standing around like Prue Leaf or Mary Berry for those of you who watch the Great British Baking Show as it's called in the rest of the world but we call it the Great British Bake Off here um, kind of judging the quality of your baking it's um, we're sort of hopefully giving people a set of tools and that they can figure out how to use them for themselves and how they work best in their particular context and for their particular project and I guess we think of the book as a similar thing that it's you know use it how you will basically um, it's up to you and uh, and in many ways the writing of the book and producing the book kind of echoed the reflexive TA process in that there was a lot of reflexivity for us a lot of dialogue a lot of conversation a lot of kind of checking assumptions and kind of throwing things out and starting again which is what the TA process can kind of look like it can be quite messy and complicated and drawn out and go in a completely different direction than you first anticipated. But I think that's, for me, that's a good practice, both in writing and doing reflexive TA, that you kind of embrace the mess and embrace the journey, taking a bit of a detour. So um, speaking about the, the mess and the detours and everything else, um, can you talk to us a little bit more about the processes that you went through in terms of writing, how that works for you, um, and also some of the uh, impacts of things like pandemics and things like that. Jen, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, um, so I think, you know, we've, we've sort of had um, a writing process that has evolved, and it evolved from the first paper we wrote, that 2006 paper, we'd known each other for years before that, because we started our PhDs together on the same day. Um, at Loughborough University back in a year that I won't mention, but if you read the book, you'll, it may be revealed. Um, and, but we hadn't kind of written together as a, a project and I was on sabbatical in the UK in, in 2005 and we decided to finally write this paper. And 
the way we wrote it was literally being physically in the same place and basically talking our way through the paper, figuring out what we wanted to say, how we wanted to say it, grappling with ideas, and actually kind of like literally having one of us sit at the computer and type while the other one said, no, not like that, or yes, like that, or having some friendly arguments occasionally, but mostly having a very kind of collaborative um, process. And, and, and that sort of has stood us in good stead. So even though we're located on opposite sides of the globe, um, we often um, do bits independently, but then have times when we're together and we've had sort of writing retreats over the years when we've sort of sat down and really tackled big writing tasks like successful qualitative research. That our first book, we did a whole lot of that. Um, and so that's, I think that's been, I think that's a key for me, one of the sort of joys of our collaborative writing process is that we can kind of have those very real, very live, very deep kind of conversations about things and kind of figure it out as we go along. Now, unfortunately, with um, the pandemic being what it is, <laughs> we can't be in the same physical um, space and place, but we had done a lot of the, like we had basically a, a full draft of the book. Um, when the pandemic hit and but it meant that we had to do a lot of back and forth and a lot of uh, we we do a lot of track changes our documents become multi-layers of track changes and then we have to like accept all changes and move on because they become unreadable and I think we have um, we have a very layered process like I think in the book um, we talk about the value of editing and you know we most things we write probably go through I don't know, six versions at a minimum of layers of edit and figuring things out and so on. So the pandemic has made it much harder. Like we haven't ever tried a kind of like sit and write together and, and health issues and things like that. Um, and time differences get in the way of such things when you're not in the same um, location. Um, so, but it, to me, it sort of definitely feels like a diminished writing experience when we can't do that sort of literally in the same space and time process. Vic, did you want to add? I mean, it's, it's probably worth saying that the book didn't reach its final form until the very last minute. You know, one of the final discussions we have is, should we keep this chapter in the book or should we put it on the companion website? And it's a chapter about teaching and supervision. And it ended up being open access on the companion website. And it was, yeah, so our process is, I guess like the reflective TA process, it's kind of, it's not done until it's done. You know, things can change right up until the last minute. And it's a sense of, I know it's a textbook and it looks quite solid and definitive, but it is just capturing a kind of moment in time that, you know, our thinking will continue to evolve, will continue to question and, and explore and refine. And so um, hopefully this book doesn't become as fixed in time as the kind of 2006 paper and that, um, we introduce people to the idea that, you know, methodologists, you know, they don't, they're not frozen in time, that their ideas and their thinking can continue to evolve. So it's kind of, this is where we're at now, the book. This is what we're offering up to the world is this is where we're at now, rather than this is the absolute definitive last word and we'll never have anything else to say about it. That leads me really nicely into a question that's been upvoted quite a lot, if that's okay which is um, somebody called Abigail who's doing a qualitative study with students in counselling research and they've been encouraged to use reflexive TA and they're keen to understand the differences between reflexive TA and your 2006 original idea of TA so I thought you might quite like to speak to that and it's clearly something people are interested to hear an answer on. Okay shall I take I'll start with that one. Um, so it's, it's not like massive, like we haven't fundamentally changed it into something completely different. What we've done is we've learned more. So we've learned more about the kind of wider landscape of qualitative research and thematic analysis. And that kind of speaks to the point that Ginny made right at the start, you know, that we're not all knowing, all seeing experts, that we're learning constantly about qualitative research. There's lots of things we haven't kind of heard of. And we get asked questions all the time about stuff. And we're like, oh, I've never heard of that. I don't know. Um, so it's not it's not huge, but it's it reflects how our kind of thinking has evolved. So and we've also seen how our work has been misrepresented, misunderstood, the way it's confused people. And so we've tried to 
clarify things in ways that um, address those misunderstandings. So we changed the name of the six phases um, ever so slightly. So one thing that we used to say in well, one thing that we said in the 2006 paper was we named the kind of initial theme development phases searching for themes. And we thought people will understand that we don't mean that themes kind of exist in your data as real things kind of floating around and your job as a researcher is to kind of pluck them out and say, hurrah, here's a theme. Um, but clearly that's what people took from that language. So we realized, even though we were trying to be really careful about language, that we hadn't been careful enough and that we needed to make sure the language we used in describing the approach reflected our underlying conceptualization of the process and of concepts like themes. So we settled on, I think I'm probably going to get it wrong, generating initial themes, both to signal the fact that the researcher is kind of active in the production of themes, but also that the themes that you start to kind of work with early on uh, are kind of initial and provisional and that the process might mean that those themes get considerably refined, developed, rejected, that you start over. So we try to be more careful in our language. So that's sort of one development. And another understanding that we have is how our approach fits in with other approaches and the different understandings other approaches have. So one thing that we emphasize quite a bit in the book that we didn't emphasize in the paper is how we understand and conceptualize themes. So we understand themes as broadly speaking a kind of pattern of shared meaning underpinned by a central concept so in creating themes you're telling a story you're telling the reader a story about an aspect of your data another really common way that what we think of as themes is understood is as topic summaries so here's a topic like um i can never think of examples when i try and think of examples um, so here's a topic like um, barriers to participation in exercise. And what the theme does is tell the reader everything or the main things the participant said in relation to that topic. But there's nothing that unifies those observations. There's no kind of story there. It's just, well, these are all the barriers. There was this barrier and that barrier and the other barrier. And we've noticed that there's a lot of confusion in published TA research but also in the kind of student work we look at as well, between those two understandings of themes, the kind of shared meaning storytelling theme and the topic summary theme. What one of my students memorably described as a bucket theme in the sense that the researcher gets a bucket, slaps the label on it, you know, topic, barriers to exercise, and then just chucks all the data in the bucket kind of relevant to that topic and then sort of pours it out onto the page. There's no thought about the kind of patterning in relation to that or the story around that. So one thing that we really emphasize in the book is how we conceptualize and understand themes and how that differs from the topic summary approach that you do see in other approaches to kind of TA. So those are two of the main things that come to mind. Jin, can you think of um, any other differences? Um, I, I thought it might be useful to just kind of give an example like related to, to a theme and reflexive TA. You know, you, um, Vic just talked about that kind of idea of barriers to exercise. So what might a reflexive TA theme look like and how might that be different? And so, you know, you might have um, an analysis where you develop um, a story about um, why people don't um, exercise. And one of the themes might be centered around, um, you know, uh, exercise is costly. And that might seem like, OK, so that's pretty clear. You might focus on, you know, gym membership or those sorts of things. But you could also include within a reflexive TA approach a whole lot of other ideas about the cost of exercise in your life. So people might say, you know, well, I'm I'm um, so-called, you know, time poor. And so if I choose exercise, I, I miss out on something else, like it might be spending time with my family or opportunities to earn money or to study or something like that. There might be other costs um, that are sort of even more broadly conceptualized than something like that. So what, what unites a, themes and, a theme and reflexive TA is this kind of I, a central kind of idea that really holds it all together. And it can hold quite, um, so it can still hold quite um, things that on the surface seem quite disparate, like 
you know, it costs a lot to go to the gym and I miss out on seeing my friends. They might not seem like they're the same thing at all. But if what your theme focuses on is there are costs to having exercise, which stop me doing it, then those things all kind of make sense as the same kind of idea or principle. So, and I think that's like, as, as Vic mentioned, that's one of the sort of fundamental differentiations. And we, when we first write, started writing, we kind of thought that people would get that. And clearly um, we've had to really shape and think about um, that and why that matters um, in a method like um, reflexive TA. I think um, you've covered language and you've covered the focus on themes. The other thing, I think there are two other uh, other differences, I would say. Um, and one is a point of emphasis, and, and, and that's really about how much we emphasize the, um, the sort of subjectivity and reflexivity of the researcher and the fact that that brings value into the process. And, you know, when we were writing initially, we were writing as kind of completely immersed in qualitative worlds writers you know we existed in these qualitative spaces and we never had to um, for the most part kind of defend the idea that subjectivity is part of the process and being reflective is part of the process and we've come to realize as, as qualitative methods have become popularized which is fantastic but lots of people are using them out of contexts where um, those ideas about reflexivity are still severely challenged or they have been told that that is a bad way to do research and that you must control your bias and, and so on so it's been um so I think we've really kind of emphasized that we've we've brought um that much more strongly to the fore and provided a lot of tools for people to um engage in those processes and I can't remember what my fourth thing was now so we should have a new <laughs> question <laughs> let's come in three parts Jenny um <laughs> Just um, uh, bring a question from the Q&A. Um, when coding and developing themes, how should researchers deal with the features of a data set that seem important and relevant, but that aren't prevalent in the data set? I've seen this called saliency analysis. So maybe only one participant raises it. Um, would this not be a candidate for a theme? Um, so just tying into some of the conversation you've had around themes there. I can I can start an answer to that question. And I think, you know, reflexive TA isn't about rules. It's about understanding what story you're telling and why you're telling that story. And so sometimes in analysis, you know, you're looking for patterned meaning and shared understandings or patternings of experience and so on. And there might be something which is, very salient and significant for one person say you've you've done interviews with people about an experience and so on but it's it is you know what in a statistical term might be called an outlier or something it's it's sort of so so different to the data set and so in terms of reflexive ta i mean you've got you've got options you've got questions you could simply note this like to me something that um I probably wouldn't report that as a theme because it's only evident in one particular participant's experience, but that doesn't mean it should be, you know, erased, cleaned up from the data set and not mentioned. You might, you might mention it, you might contextualize the data set by noting it, or you might do some kind of analysis of your data set that focused on that, that wasn't a reflexive TA, but that used some other kind of um, case study or narrative or saliency type analysis methodology to to tell that particular story. Um, so I think it's, you know, one of the things that we emphasize is about, um, you know, keeping a bit of the mess there, you know, not trying to suggest that there were these kind of nice, clean, tidy, perfect boundaries. Um, and also acknowledging that the reflexive TA analysis never captures the entirety of the data set. It answers a specific research or it addresses a specific research question. And so if that bit of information that's quite different is important to addressing your research question, then find a way to bring it in somehow, but it doesn't necessarily make it a theme within a theme as conceptualized by reflexive TA. 
We need a hand signal for I've nothing to add. She answered it beautifully. <laughs> I was just about to say, do you have anything to add, Vic? Um, I mean, I guess one of the things that's been coming up throughout your talk, of course, is the use of the term reflexive. And we had some questions from people around um, reflexivity and kind of people wanting to know what it is and how to bring it in. So are there things that are important that you want to highlight about reflexivity? Um. Why don't I start on that one? Um, well, reflexivity we can think of as, well, it's a, it's a elastic, plastic concept that has lots of different meanings attached to it that takes different forms in different disciplines. I guess well, how we think about it is, particularly in relation to the researcher, is a questioning orientation when you're constantly kind of questioning yourself, questioning your assumptions. And it's it's never a complete process. You know, as any therapist will tell you, full insight into the self is is not something that's achievable. Um, so you're you're striving rather than kind of getting somewhere with reflexivity and you're questioning yourself, you're questioning your assumptions. Um, Ginny and I's writing process kind of illustrates reflexivity really beautifully. I can think back to when we were writing the 2006 paper and we sort of had a 30 minute discussion about the meaning of the word rich because we were going to just drop it into the paper. And then we thought, no, we need to kind of think about these terms that are used, that are kind of thrown around in qualitative writing. And we need to reflect on what they mean and what researchers are getting at when they use that kind of terminology, because that's part of what makes qualitative research impenetrable for people. What my students would call the kind of jargon of qualitative research. We need to actually unpack this terminology and unpack what we understand by it. So we have this kind of constant questioning dialogue. And that's a bit like the process of reflexive TA when you're reflecting on your assumptions, your positioning, what you bring to the research process. And we have some really nice illustrations of that in the book. So um, one of our students, Rachel, who did her research on um, black women talking about the idea of the strong black woman and how that factors into how they kind of manage experiences of distress and anxiety and she's got some we've got she was kind and generous enough to kind of share some entries from her reflexive diary kind of showing how she's reflecting on this data the emotions that it evoked for her she wrote a beautiful poem kind of reflecting on the experiences of conducting one of the focus group so I guess one facet of reflexivity is a dialogue with the self but you can use other people to kind of have an actual dialogue and, and use other people to help kind of reflect on your assumptions and reflect on your thinking. And that's where supervisors, collaborators, mentors and so on can kind of come into the process and they can be um, a tool for that practice of reflexivity. Jin, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it can be really hard um, to sort of be aware of your assumptions and the sort of way that your experience of the world shapes shapes the way you see and or read and engage with data and and I think you know just to sort of pick up what Victoria is talking about um, building up relationships with others where you can kind of work with data or work with your analysis can be really helpful and it's not about kind of finding the right answer or the right take on things but it's about kind of understanding where where you've kind of just completely missed something because your situatedness and your sort of positions have shaped your experience and Victoria and I when we were writing our first book um, we worked with a data set in relation to that and we had this amazing kind of um, for me it was quite an amazing revelation because I did this kind of um, we both sort of separately coded our data set and we came to the analysis and I said oh there's this like really sort of prevalent thing that's you know that's going on here and it's this it's this really negative construction of exercise and I'm you know I just like it's so prevalent and Victoria was like I didn't notice that at all and I was like how could you not how could you not notice that it's everywhere and you know what we kind of got to was this kind of recognition of our different subjectivities and our different histories of of engaging in exercise that had kind of for me, the, the story that the data were telling, the story that the participants were telling was so out of line with my own kind of like, I love exercise, 
that um, and they reflected much more closely Victoria's experience of like exercise at school and these kinds of like different um, cultural narratives around it that really sort of shaped how we engage with the data. And for me, that was such a, uh, a useful moment to kind of really um, recognize the way we are always only ever going to have a partial and a situator take. And, and that's why that's one of the reasons why being reflexive and being kind of open to questioning of yourself and questioning from others is, is really important. Um, and there was another experience that I had quite recently, and I was working with the data set that we use in the book, and it was in a research group with um, a whole lot of my students, and we were kind of talking about um, things. And one of my students um, made a comment about the data set and about you know how the, the account in this kind of moment was, um, very racialized and very race-based and kind of made an offhand comment like of course you will have talked about that and I went oh, oh I didn't read like we 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 have not talked about that in the book edit edit revise too late at that point but it was it was an amazing kind of moment of going okay so even this data set that we have interrogated and we have you know questioned ourselves and reflexively engaged with so, for so many different layers Someone comes in and says something and you go, I completely now notice something that I didn't notice before. And I think that's why it's really important to sort of embrace the partiality and not, not sort of feel like you, you're kind of getting to a final point of insight. I think I've gone way from where the original question started. <laughs> Shall I ask another one then? <laughs> yeah. So we've got um, a couple of questions about reflexivity, um, one that's very popular in the chat around how you distinguish between reflexivity and being reflective, and also questions around how to get some of that reflexivity into your published work. Shall I start with the, the say, I mean, I think the second one is really challenging because journal reporting formats do not invite and encourage that kind of personalized kind of style of writing, but also the space it takes to kind of bring that into the process. Um, so I think that is a real kind of practical challenge. Um, and I think that kind of goes bigger than individual researchers. It's about changing how we report qualitative research, perhaps making greater use of the fact that publishing is primarily digital and using kind of, um, Kind of supplementary material online and so on. I mean, I'm I'm very aware. I mean, I had the example I mentioned of um, Rachel's research when we were writing that up. It got too long. The editor said, "You have to cut things." I'll just cut the reflexivity, and so it it went out the paper. And that's I think a very typical experience for lots of qualitative researchers. You have the beautiful reflexivity, and then it goes because there isn't enough room, and you need to get the word count down. So I think it, it is quite tricky and it is quite challenging. So one of the things that we argue for in our more recent work, including the book, is trying to shift the norms around reporting formats to allow for more personalized accounts of research, to allow people to bring reflexivity in to the reporting of research and not to adopt that kind of scientist in a white coat kind of style of reporting where you're trying to pretend to be objective and all the rest of it, but to move towards something kind of more personalized. But it is complex, particularly in a discipline like psychology, which is can be very kind of policing of, of these kind of things, a more conservative discipline where students are told that they can't write in the first person, that that's bad. And you have to say it's okay, but they've really taken that on board and it, it, it's really hard to kind of undo that for them. So I often get sent drafts of reflexivity sections written in the third person, um, and which to me sort of completely defeats the purpose of reflexivity and you kind of communicating to the reader that you don't really understand this practice because you're kind of writing about yourself as the researcher did X, Y, and Z. Um, so I think it's tricky, but I do in, in um, dissertations and theses, which are more kind of flexible in their format, I do encourage students to kind of bring reflexivity into um, the methodology section to not just have a separate researcher kind of statement section, but try and kind of weave it in. Um, 
so that they reflect on the kind of process of doing the research. So Sue Wilkinson makes this really nice distinction between personal and functional reflexivity and functional reflexivity is where you kind of reflect on the methodological and design choices you've made and how these shape the research process. So you can kind of bring that into the methodology. I also encourage students to kind of bring that into the discussion as well. So to have that kind of reflective discussion when evaluating the study, for example, or reflecting on what happened. So I think there's kind of ways to bring it in in kind of non-standard reporting formats, but I think it's quite, at the moment, it is quite tricky. And I think it's a, it's a bigger discussion around how we report qualitative research. Over to you, Jen. I would just sort of add to that what we've started to see um, in the last couple of years is, is a few people who are publishing methodological pieces where they are describing their reflexive process with analysis. And that's another option, you know, to, to actually make that a focus and an exploration. So there's a, a paper by Lisa Traynor that we talk about in the book, which is a really fabulous example of, of um, the process of kind of like what this actually looked like and how, how they kind of interrogated themselves throughout throughout the process. And I've just started reading, but I haven't finished because time, um, a paper where a group of researchers talk about their process and how they kind of collaboratively engaged in the reflexive analysis process um, health re within a health research project. They were actually a, a group of mostly postgraduate students who um, wanted to kind of upskill themselves and kind of gave themselves this kind of task of working with and analyzing some data. Um, and so I think that's another way to do it. Um, and I think I think you you mentioned this, Victoria, but just to make it kind of really explicit, one of the things that we um, have emphasized in the writing process is not to just simply write a, a neutral descriptive, like here are the six phases and I went through these, but rather talk about what you did and what what choices you made and what that actually looked like in practice as you did that for your specific project um, and instead of treating those six phases as um, like rigid rule things that you must sort of follow to the letter instead going okay so what do I understand by this and what did that mean and what did that look like in terms of my coding process or my theme development process and um, and how did that actually map on to the sort of assumptions and the um the sort of outcomes I guess that I kind of produced as a result of the of the process yeah I would just add to that there is a really nice example in the book um from one of our students Louise Davey of her kind of writing of her analytic process it's a, it's a nice long example that goes over a couple of pages and we've lifted it directly from her well, obviously with her permission directly from her thesis where she describes how she engaged in the process and that's a really nice way that you can kind of bring reflexivity into the process so she she just has these really nice observations about she noticed when she kind of started um um, so she's got this nice quotation, I also moved between different physical environments, sitting on the grass in quiet rural places, at my desk, in busy cafes, and in the university library, among others. I was conscious that these changing spaces brought shifts in my mood and energy, shaping and colouring my analytic sensibility and interpretive responses to the data. That's just a lovely bit of detail that brings alive a sense of how Louise kind of did her analysis, and I think that's a really nice area where you can bring reflexivity both into kind of journal articles but also into dissertations and theses to give the reader a lively sense of what you actually did and it doesn't matter if it's messy and it doesn't matter if you didn't do it properly I mean we don't kind of do it properly <laughs> our process yeah. is quite kind of messy and all over the place and and so you're 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 kind of telling the reader about how you engaged in the process rather than I followed the six you know six phases that's not hugely interesting you know if you've read the paper you know what they are you kind of want to know well what did you do so I think both of us reviewed the um the Lisa Trainer paper and one of the kind of suggestions we made in the review is you know what what recommendations would you have for other researchers you know should everyone be writing this kind of paper as an addendum to a research project um and I think in a way that's taking something from that suggestion, I think is quite useful that perhaps, you know, if you do a journal article, you could do supplementary material where you have a bit more detail around the process. 
in a thesis, you have the scope with those non-traditional formats to bring some of that detail in. And that's a way of kind of doing and demonstrating reflexivity. And it also kind of demystifies the process. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, we've had a lot of feedback that our TA writing makes kind of qualitative um, research accessible for people that were maybe kind of confused about the process. But I think these kinds of pieces, which really sort of show the messy process and the reflexive process are really a rich, you know, I see them as a really rich gift to the kind of methodological literature because you're sort of, you are actually uh, pulling back the curtains and going, so this is actually what it, what it involved instead of somehow, um, sort of almost evoking a mystical or magical process. And we kind of really much, really kind of want to go against that idea that it is a mystical, magical process and that, you know, it's a reflexive and engaged um, process and it involves kind of the active subjective research and making those choices. Awesome, just to change tack a little bit. Um, there's been a question on YouTube from Angela Williamson uh, and uh, wanting to ask uh, how you would dis distinguish between codes and themes. Um, so that's a pretty broad topic to cover for the next little bit. <laughs> Shall I start with that one? I mean, I think there's no, you know, this is going to get really annoying, but there's no absolute distinction to be made between codes and themes. They're not sort of real things and you can go that's a code that's a theme that's a code that's a theme so they're kind of tools for kind of doing analysis um but that said that kind of caveat aside codes tend to capture a single insight a single kind of facet of meaning in relation to something and um we kind of we've kind of stumbled on this this notion that you need enough codes to kind of pass out different kind of facets of meaning, um, which is kind of a nice way of conceptualizing it, that your codes want to be fine grained enough to kind of get all the intricacies of meaning, but not so fine grained that you're not getting some kind of recurrence and kind of patterning across the data. So I think when we initially were writing, we used the kind of analogy of a brick and tile house, but we moved away from that because Ginny decided it was too English um, and wouldn't, wouldn't translate <laughs> for people around the world. But that's a good way of thinking about it, that if your code is the brick and your wall, one wall of the house is, the, is a theme, um, that it's a, a theme is captures lots of different observations, has lots of different facets and is made up of lots of different codes. So code generally single facet theme generally multi-facet but it's not an absolute dis um, distinction you might find when you're analyzing your data that a code starts to get really meaty and really complex and you end up doing what i think kathy sharma has calls promoting your code to a theme you might do some further work on it refining it and developing it and so on but you might find that a code forms the basis of a theme so I want to try and kind of hold on to that idea that there are differences, but it's not an absolute distinction because these aren't real things. They're tools, they're devices for helping us to do our analysis. You're not, the codes kind of aren't existing in the data and you're kind of plucking them out in the same way the themes aren't in the data and you're kind of plucking them out. This is something that you're creating through your interpretive engagement. Over to you, Jen. Said it all beautifully. Okay. So there's quite a few questions that are asking around the intersections, the overlaps, the distinctions between IPA and TA and how you might use them together or whether you could. So I wondered if you would like to speak to some of those types of questions. I'll start answering it and Ginny can send you a link to the paper where we <laughs> have written about this. So we have written a um, a paper um, that compares and contrasts the differences and similarities between IPA and other kind of pattern based methods that will kind of give you a more detailed kind of answer to that question. Um, and that was, in fact, going to be a chapter in the book. Um, but in the great book shrinking process from the ridiculously long book to the still very long book, um, that chapter evolved and became a paper. Um, so I suggest having a read of that paper and also to look at our um, University of Auckland thematic analysis website, because we have lots of FAQs on that website. And one of them is what are the differences between TA and IPA. So I would say the differences hinge in kind of two areas. 
One is that IPA, we can think of it as more methodology than method, and TA is more method than methodology, and um, also differences around kind of procedure. So IPA is informed by a particular a take on phenomenology as a philosophy, so we're combining both descriptive and interpretive phenomenology. So it provides you with a kind of ready-made package of theoretical underpinnings, the dreaded ontology and epistemology, um, the kind of research questions you should be asking. It provides you lots of suggestions about how you should be collecting data and what kind of data you need. And it gives you lots of guidance around how you design a study. So it's a kind of full package, what some people refer to as kind of ready-made um, methodologies. I quite like the build a bear analogy. If you think of going into the toy shop and buying a teddy bear, you've got a teddy bear, it's got fur, it's got stuffing, it's got nose, eyes, might have a ribbon on, or you can go into build a bear workshop and you'll create a bear, it will have all the same elements, but you've kind of put it together that you've created it. And TA is like the build a bear in the sense that the end product will have all the same elements as a methodology. It will have theoretical underpinnings, research questions, design choices, and so on. But TA puts you in the driving seat and gives you lots of flexibility about how you implement the method. So with IPA, there's still choices to be made, but they're delimited in various ways because it's a methodology. TA, there's a lot more flexibility around the kinds of questions you ask, how you collect data, and so on. And in terms of procedure, procedurally, they're quite different. Um, so with IPA, you're working on a case first. So you're working with a, the data from the individual participant, typically an interview transcript, and you're developing themes in relation to that before you then go on to work on the next case and the next case and the next case. Whereas with TA, you are working across all the data through one whole process. So you code all the data, then you start your theme development process. So the procedures look quite different, but there are lots of overlaps. There are lots of similarities. And if you're doing a phenomenological approach to TA, the output of a TA and an IPA can be quite similar. I think one thing that's been emphasized in recent IPA literature is the ideographic focus of IPA. And that's not really a feature of TA. So TA is about the kind of patterns of meaning that cut across the data whereas IPA combines both that thematic focus with a more ideographic focus, focusing on the unique characteristics of individual participants. So participant groups tend to be smaller because you're having a more in-depth focus on kind of individual participants. But again, this is kind of a textbook characterization. Um, and you see TA work on case studies, um, phenomenologically oriented, and it can look very much like um, an IPA. So I would say that um, uh, methods have different histories, they come from different places, they're designed to kind of do different things, but what makes them what makes them kind of distinctive is how you sort of engage with them and how you use them. So you kind of um, bring the difference if you like. And you can engage with IPA in a way that it ends up looking like TA and you can engage with TA in a way that ends up looking like kind of IPA. So I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about um, getting the right method, you know, choosing between the two, which one's best. I would focus on choosing an appropriate method. Um, and people have combined I IPA and TA together. There's a paper, um, but I can't remember the name of the authors. Can you remember, Jim? No, but I know the one you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> that compares kind of TA and IPA looking at the same data set, but they use TA in a very IPA way. So they're kind of, they look more similar than they might otherwise. Um, I will have a Google and see if I can find it. Um, is there anything while, you want while to you're add? doing that? Yeah. yeah, while you're doing that. Um, I think, you know, what this kind of um, highlights and what we've kind of emphasized in that, in that paper is that, you know, there can be almost an idea that you, you know you can find the perfect method for your study. Um, but for lots of qualitative, research, you know, there are a number of different kind of approaches that you could choose to grapple with whatever it is that you're wanting to address. And so there is, there can be some overlap between say IPA and, and TA. And it's not, it's not about finding the perfect method, but finding a usable functional method. And also a method that, you know, you know, if you're in an environment where there's a lot of IPA um, expertise, 
you know, it makes sense to to use that expertise and to draw on that if it um, fits with your, you know, your research question and so on. And it also kind of um, highlights, I think, you know, we don't talk about um, phenomenology particularly as an interpretative framework for, for TA, but I recently got a, an email question through saying, you know, I'm doing a TA study and I'm I'm using I want to use hermeneutics as my kind of interpretive framework, but you don't you don't mention hermeneutics. Is is there a reason why you don't? Does that mean I can't use it? And my response was like, you know, no, we don't we don't mention hermeneutics because it's not a, a big framework within the areas that we work and operate, you know, like it's not one of the dominant theoretical approaches within the psychology that we practice. And so, you know, the the absence of mentioning it doesn't mean that it's not allowed, not allowed, you know, like that was kind of like the, and the same goes with, you know, phenomenology. We don't necessarily talk about it in much detail, but that doesn't mean it doesn't work and it doesn't fit. And so when you're engaging with the book and the these kind of writing that's about kind of, you know, taking ownership of that process and going, does this interpretative framework or broad theory then allow me to um, engage and address my research question? And does it, does it align with the values and the premises and the assumptions of reflective TA? And that final point is a, a really crucial one because, you know, if you're doing a really kind of um, positivist empiricist sort of um, what we might call, um, or even post-positivist, but still quite small Q um, type of project, and that's what you want to do, then maybe that doesn't fit so, so well with reflexive TA and a different method is a, a better one to use. Yeah, just to add, it's really helpful to understand the values behind the approach, because when you understand the values, you can make these kind of decisions for yourself. It's not about a set of rules that you must do or not do certain things. So if you can build some confidence in understanding the values of the approach, then it will enable you to kind of make these kind of choices and not feel kind of anxious that you're kind of getting it wrong because you understand the ethos of the approach and why it works the way it works and say, therefore, this is a good fit, but that isn't a good fit. And, and I think just to add to that, it's it's about explaining that and, and saying why that particular approach worked or was useful and, you know, facilitated your project. Um, so I've got a double barreled question um, from a few um, a few people that have asked about saturation. So I'll frame it probably in terms of the saturation question. Um, but uh, the first part is uh, that uh, someone's asked that with a, um, or, sorry, they said they would love to hear where you are currently at on your journey uh, in relation to the concept of saturation. Um, and related and uh, probably quite important is, are you hopeful that we'll be able to continue to resist or be able to resist um, reviewers' demands to reach saturation? I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with this and say, um, we left the saturation shoreline a long time ago and it has disappeared far beyond the horizon. And we, we I, I would say, I speak for both of us to say that we probably anticipate never returning. Um, to that place, unless we're doing, a, say, a grounded theory um, study where it aligns and makes sense. Um, but kind of, I think um, the question of resistance is, is a really challenging one for people because it is such a pervasive notion and it fits with something Victoria mentioned earlier that I can't remember now, but about the ways in which there are these kinds of um, almost like truths that oh it was about richness richness like ideas that kind of just exist as kind of truths within qualitative researching that that you don't question necessarily and I you know I will say absolutely did not question saturation as a concept for a long time in terms of and you know I have you can look through many published papers where I will have mentioned saturation in my um, data collection process so um, I think, you know, it's about, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's so embedded that people in articulating it don't necessarily know what they're asking for or why they're asking for it, just that it's a kind of quality marker. And, and, you know, it's not a, you should never mention saturation, but it, that it know what it's about and why to use it. And so that's why we've written a whole paper on saturation. And, I think, you know, it, it is just going to be a slow chipping away at that 
um, solid basalt rock of saturation that um, reviewers and editors can sometimes put in front of us. And um, we've, you know, I think something that's happened recently though is that there has been a bit of an upsurge in critical engagement and questioning around this. And so, you know, we published our paper a couple of years ago, but there's been a whole lot of different papers that have really sort of pushed um, different um, uh, and questioning of saturation. And I think one of the um, papers and concepts that we've really liked that we talk in the book as an alternative is a notion of information power. So um, uh, I think Norwegian researcher, Christy of Alterwood has talked about um, this concept of information power as a better guiding principle for qualitative researchers than, um, than saturation. And she, she has a whole lot of kind of, um, discussion of what that means and it's really worth looking up and using that as an alternative argument so that's there's not that there's nothing you can say if you don't claim saturation there are other arguments to make Thank you. yeah and she's framed it quite strategically so it sounds quite concrete but when you kind of read around it it's actually loose and interpretive and reflects the kind of ethos of qualitative research but she's framed it in a way that I think is really helpful when you're trying to persuade a reviewer or an editor that you don't need to kind of saturate. I mean I think the other thing that's unhelpful is things like the recent uh, well relatively recent kind of APA reporting standards kind of mention saturation and don't really provide any other kind of examples or kind of rationales for why for, for how you'd kind of think about the size of your data set. So I think as much as we're kind of working against it, there are also kind of voices that are seeing this as a kind of good idea. So I think we resigned ourselves to seeing um, us as in constant battle with positivist encroaches on kind of qualitative analysis. There's also another paper, I think that we might have the link to hand um, by, um, a medical education researcher Lara Varpio, I apologize if I'm pronouncing that name incorrectly, that looks at concepts like saturation, member checking, and argues that these concepts um, came from kind of, or are concepts that enabled qualitative research to gain a foothold in positivist dominated disciplines because they made sense in that logic and in that language. And they're now sort of really weighing down qualitative research unhelpfully as baggage. And if anyone follows me on Twitter, you'll have seen I've tweeted that paper about a billion times because I think it's such a great argument and a great understanding. And it's a really good one to kind of give to people who are really kind of struggling with um, the idea that qualitative research represents a kind of values framework rather than just kind of tools and techniques, because it, it shows how quantitative informed values can kind of encroach and shape qualitative research in ways that aren't helpful. I mean, fair enough, if you want to do positivist qual, then all those concepts make sense, but they don't make sense for qualitative research conducted within a qualitative values framework. Um, and just to follow up a little bit, there's a question from the Q&A. Um, so, and, and related to some of this conversation already, and you've touched on some of these points, um, your top tips for a novice in terms of knowing when to stop collecting data. Um, what are the things that, um, uh, you know, a richness was one of the things you've already raised, but uh, are there other things that you would sort of identify um, that are important for a novice in particular? Shall I um, start with that one? Um... I think it kind of depends on your purpose. So if you're doing a student project and if it's your first kind of go at qualitative research, then you're really kind of in a learning process and you kind of need to give yourself a bit of space and time to learn. So one thing I often find with students doing their first qualitative interviews, for example, that the first couple of interviews can be a bit bad, a bit terrible. They're obviously very anxious and nervous, which is completely understandable. I still get I mean, I haven't done an interview for years now, but, you know, the last one I did, I was still really nervous because it's this weird encounter where you go in the home of someone you've never met before and they tell you kind of intimate details of their life. And it's like, where's the rule book for this social encounter? Um, so those kind of pragmatic things might factor into your decision making. If you do your first few interviews and they're not great, you might want to do have a slightly bigger kind of data set to kind of compensate for the thinness but it is really a judgment related to the kind of pragmatics of what you're doing 
and it's really hard to put kind of formulaic numbers on it. We do in our textbook, Successful Qualitative Research, we give some kind of rules of thumb, so some very kind of loose kind of recommendations around kind of data set size, depending on the kind of methods that you're using and so on. But you want enough data so you've got a rich basis for analysis, but not so much that it's going to be overwhelming, that it's going to be too much to deal with within the time. And it's really hard to kind of say, if you've got seven months to complete your project, it will mean you need this many because it, it really depends on the individual data items, the, the richness of them, you know, the complexity, the depth and so on. So it's really hard. to. So it is an interpretive judgment, which I know is a hard message when you're looking for some degree of certainty, but hopefully you've got a supervisor who can help you kind of make that interpretive judgment about when you have enough. And you might be surprised about when you feel you have enough data. So one of my students um, was doing IPA and was planning to do around sort of 10 interviews. Um, and she was doing a professional doctorate and their recommendation is sort of 10 to 12 interviews and she got to no six to ten sorry and she got to six interviews and they were so rich they were so complex they were long they were really detailed and the participants experiences were really disparate that we felt at that point she had enough that it was enough to provide a really rich analysis but it was um she'd only be able to do justice to six you know if she had seven or eight she'd be kind of wouldn't be able to kind of focus as much on kind of individual experiences so it's um it is a kind of an interpretive judgment Jin do you have anything more concrete that you can add to that just to just to be the reassuring person um coming in at the end I mean I think you know as a as a once you build up experience with kind of qualitative research you do get um uh, i guess a, a, a an intuitive sense of that sort of thing and and so you know that's why we have provided kind of estimates or rough broad um suggestions in our in our in our book and i think those are a useful starting point and i had a student who um who um you know, is using story completion data. And the, the, the stories are, are mostly fairly small and she has 180 stories that she's working with. And um, I think, you know, initially, like if you if you printed that out, it's a quite small data set for a, a qualitative project. And this is an honours dissertation, which in New Zealand is a, a seven month project. And, um, and she's kind of exclaimed at the richness of the data and how it's been kind of like and her process has been intense so she sort of she described to me the other day she said oh i've had i've had i've got this many codes she's finished now but she said i had i had that many codes is that too many and i was like no that's fine you know there's there's a lot going on um but do do start with those guidelines and talk to people who have more experience if if you know your supervisors have more experience that's okay and the other the other, just the final thing i wanted to say is that you know certainly here our ethics processes kind of say how many participants are you going to use and i know that in some countries the ethics requirements can be quite sort of um strict around like specifying sample size or those sorts of things and you know what i always do with my students is say well based on guidelines from qualitative you know research and our experience we estimate that the sample will be between you know um 15 to 25 interviews but that will the final will depend on you know and that is completely appropriate within the qualitative approaches so actually kind of building a broad scope into ethics and explaining that that is part of the process I think is a good way to tackle that if that's a question that comes up in your context great fab so moving from sample size to thinking about going about analyses so we've had a few questions around the process of having more than one researcher involved so Catherine, for example, says, what's your position on more than one researcher in terms of coming together to define the deep te the themes, teams, themes? Um, and we had other questions around, is it better to have only one person doing it? And at what point do you come together? So I'm sure you can speak to that working together with others on TA. Shall I start with that? I think, um, I think we've realized we kind of imagine the process as a solo researcher, because I think when we were first writing, we were writing for students. And when students are doing a project, they're going to be doing it by themselves. They have some input from a supervisor. Um, so that sort of that 
does reflect how we've kind of written about it, kind of imagining a solo researcher. And it's not an approach that is kind of expressly designed for team research and expressly designed for um, researchers to kind of work to be together to engage in the process. So there are approaches like framework analysis, for example, that are specifically designed for a team to conduct the analysis. So it doesn't kind of, it doesn't kind of, um, it's not designed for that process, but it doesn't mean to say that it can't be used in that way. And we've, you know, we've all certainly kind of used it together to produce kind of different analyses on, on various projects, but there's no kind of formula for it. Um, I did suggest to someone on Twitter that they write a paper about the process, you know, just reflecting on their process and kind of what they did, because I think that would be a really helpful part of the conversation is, is to how do people kind of go about and engage in this process as a team. So I definitely don't think it is a method just for a single researcher that you can use it with two researchers or a team of researchers, but there is no rule book or procedure for doing that. Um, so when Ginny and I, for example, Ginny talked about the um, data that we kind of coded separately for um, our textbook successful qualitative research, we did bits separately and kind of bits together. And we had conversations where we decided how to kind of develop things and so on and, and what kind of things to focus on and how to kind of take things forward. Um, so I imagine if researchers are working together, it will be something of that messy process where you do some things separately and some things together. But yeah, there's no rule book for it. You guys are just going to have to figure it out for yourselves. I think just the, the only thing I would add into that is that if you are doing it with other um, people for reflexive TA, it's important to kind of emphasize that you're not kind of trying to get a consensus and trying to get to the single final truth, but that the, the different people that come into the process to imagine their roles as kind of uh, interpretative enhancement or analytic enhancement. So people are bringing um, different things to engage with the data that allow you to kind of interrogate, grapple with, understand, explore meaning and what that meaning means um, or might mean um, in a richer way. So, you know, like I think something that Victoria and I have um, grappled with in, in our experience of sort of supervising around this is almost like that sense. And I think we talk about this in the book. It, we talked about it at some point. I don't know if it made the final edit, but you know how you can, um, you know, you can have a kind of engagement where you're supervising with a student and you're starting to sort of get excited by things in the data that are quite different to what they're um, noticing and, and thinking about and interested in exploring. And it can be hard because they can kind of almost go, if they're feeling inexperienced or uncertain, they're almost like, oh, um, my supervisor's got the right analysis. That's the perfect analysis. That's the proper one. I have to do it. Um, rather than going, okay, they're, they're bringing different things into this process. And what is what they're kind of engaging with relevant and useful for my research question? And should we find a way to incorporate this insight or is it just not relevant? Um, so yeah, so don't, don't feel like it's about getting to the final perfect analysis. And we do just put it in the book. We have it in the oh. teaching and supervising chapter on the companion website. So we talk a bit about me getting carried away in supervision and getting really overexcited because I love analyzing data <laughs> and how that can kind of impact on students because they think because you know you're saying it must be good and that isn't necessarily the case. And we talk about um, a student I was working with who was taking a very experiential orientation to their data that made perfect sense for their research question but I was bringing my kind of critical I'm hesitating to say critical gender because that has different connotations these days lens to the um, data and um, I was kind of getting excited by different things and kind of noticing different things in the data because I was coming at it from this different orientation and we kind of discussed it and worked it out and the student kind of incorporated some of that into their analysis in ways that kind of made sense for their framework. So I think you can have different lenses and different takes, but you can find ways to kind of bring those together and that can be really useful and productive. So a question from uh, Twitter, and hopefully I'm pronouncing her name correct, uh, Maria Houghton, uh, tips on the practicalities of how to do coding. So examples, of, uh, for example, if you uh, don't use software, what's the best way to keep track of your developing coding framework um, as you are coding pages and pages of transcript? Wow. I can, um, 
I can start it with that one. Um, I think, you know, I would say there's no best way and it's it's finding a system that works for you. And I really want to kind of emphasize system because you want to be systematic in the process. So, you know, I am still very much a hard copy by hand coder. Sometimes I've, I've bought a writable um, tablet now and sometimes I do my hard copy on a writable <laughs> tablet and sometimes I do it on actual hard copy. Um, but that still works for me. But that means there's no way of kind of automatic what my um, uh, what my codes are. And so um, I um, that's one way to do it. I have students who will use something like Microsoft Word and the comments function. Gareth might want to um, add a comment about comments functions and Word a, a little bit later. Um, and uh, if I do hard copy, what I often do is um, then type up a list of codes and so on. So I think there's um, there's different ways to tackle that process and there's no right or wrong way. But what you have to make sure is that you have a, a systematic way of keeping track of what your codes are or your code labels, um, what bits of data they're attached to and being able to kind of assess and evaluate them all as, a, as an overall kind of cluster of codes later on in the process. Um, I think I've had students that move across different types of technologies too. So um, using kind of computer software, hard copy, Word or even Excel and, and shifting across those different things at different points in the process. Vic? Yeah, and I've, I mean, I've used everything from, I mean, you know, those of you who aren't as old as us won't remember file cards. Um, back in the non-digital age, these kind of little, I don't know what paper size they were, kind of um, little cards that you'd you'd have, you'd file things on them and using them. And I'd kind of write the code label out and then literally hand write the data out, the data extract kind of relevant to the code label onto the file card. But I'm a very... Um, I've had a bad day today because I've been spending a lot of time on spreadsheets and I hate spreadsheets because you can't kind of see everything at once. It's kind of hidden in cells. And so I'm a kind of visual person. I like everything laid out in front of me. So it's kind of figuring out how you like to engage with things and kind of what works for you. So I like the file cards because I could see everything. And then when I finished the coding process, I had them all spread out on the um, the dining room floor of the flat I was living at the time, in, which was quite big. And so had this huge space to kind of spread all the codes out and kind of move them physically around. And I found that really useful. Um, and I've also done things where I kind of cut and paste the data into kind of separate Word documents. I mean, all very low tech. Um, I've never used, well, I've been trained on, but never particularly used kind of computer software. So there are loads of different ways to do it. I just think it, it's finding out a process that kind of works for you and that makes sense for you. And we do in the book kind of discuss kind of different possibilities um, so it's kind of, I would say, particularly if you're new to try things out and kind of see what works. And it also depends on the data set as well, because often more recently we've been working on um, story completion data, which is quite contained. And it's not the mess of kind of, you know, transcripts and 20, 30, 40 interviews, which are a kind of different um, thing to manage so I think you need to kind of tailor it to the kind of data that you're using as well so sorry there isn't a kind of definitive answer there it's more um, permission to figure out what works for you uh, perfect so um, there are so many questions and I'm aware that we're not going to get through anything like all of them okay but one of the ones that's oh. very popular and that I really like is what would Brown and Clark in 2021 say, want to say to Brown and Clark 2006? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's such a good question. Because you'll be writing about <laughs> thematic analysis forever. Um. Oh, that is a really good question. And um, Victoria's kind of joking. Um, but it's not, it, 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 I think it's not actually true because, you know, one of the things that we unwittingly discovered was that how much we enjoy doing this. And so that was, um, so we wouldn't tell ourselves to not do it. Um, I, I don't know. Victoria, any thoughts? 
I think I'd say you have a lot to learn, which we do and have done over the last. Um, I mean, I think the problem is if we went back and had that conversation with ourselves, we'd have never written the paper because we'd have realised um, how much we had to learn and how much we didn't understand. Um, and we'd have been terrified and we'd never would have done it. But I think it's we kind of did that based on the kind of confidence that our kind of PhD training had given us, which was very, very focused on methodology and the kind of doing a research and the whys of research and so on. And so it gave us kind of confidence to do that methodological writing. But since we wrote that paper and we just imagined we'd write that paper, no one would read it and we'd kind of move back on with doing gender and sexuality research. We had no anticipation whatsoever of the kind of um, how popular it's become and how engaged it's been. But, um, we had so much to learn. We had to learn a lot about thematic analysis. We obviously knew a bit and we'd done, we went to the library and we got all the books we could find on thematic analysis that when we were kind of writing the paper, but we have learned so much in the, how many years is it? 15 years since we kind of wrote it. Um, and our understanding has evolved. And I think as well, our confidence has um, developed in our not knowing and our fact that our understanding is always kind of provisional and tentative, um, that we don't know everything, that people talk about things that we've never heard of and we go, ah, I don't know anything about that. And that's OK. So I think, yeah, I think I'd say that, but then I'd realise that we'd never write the paper because we so terrified. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good answer. And, you know, it. it it reflects that we wrote it with a very different imagined audience than what the actual audience was ultimately. Yeah. yeah, it's very scary to write for an audience where you know thousands of people are going to be engaging in something. You know, we were we're both kind of critical gender and sexuality researchers um, talking to very small specialist sympathetic audiences and the idea that we'd be writing work that hundreds of thousands of people would cite, read, download, you know, never crossed our minds. And if you, I mean, I was pretty nervous about this evening because the audience was quite big and you're like, ah, okay, how do you meet the needs of that diverse kind of um, audience and that big audience? But I think you just have to imagine that we're speaking to six people because otherwise it would just be too overwhelming. So um, one um, final question um, or final uh, direction, I guess, uh, is uh, to have a look at the companion website, um, which you've talked about a bit uh, and all the extra materials that are associated with that. Uh, so is there anything you want to direct us to or to uh, demonstrate or show? Um, I might share my screen so we can talk through a bit. Does that sound good, Victoria? Yeah, it sounds good. Um, I'll just make sure I've got the right companion website looking looking good <laughs> at the start and this is where it could all go horribly wrong um open access yeah um okay okay so uh, okay i'm not getting um, let's see right here we are okay um so one of the things that that we did um in writing the book was write um, a lot of um, supplementary resources that kind of elaborated or enriched the process. And that's everything that you can find on the, um, the companion website. And you find this link through um, the book. I'll say a bit and then you can jump in, Victoria. And so um, the companion website has, um, has all the resources listed by chapter um, here on the left. And then it has um, a range of different resources. But one of the most useful features I wanted to just kind of highlight is that there's a resource map. And if you go to the resource map, you can sort of see everything organized by the different type of resource that it is. So we have data sets for you to work with. Um, if you're teaching or if you want to kind of um, play around with the process, there's data sets, the data sets we use in the book, as well as other data sets as well. So these are mapped out on this part of the site, but the main landing page for the site has everything organized by chapter. So if you're, um, you're reading chapter one, um, you can click on um, 
the companion yeah. website and find additional resources. Um, yeah. Victoria, do you want to um, add into that? Um, I disappeared for a moment. Opening the companion website sent me out of Zoom. I don't know how <laughs> quite that works. So I don't I'm know sorry. what you've mentioned already, but um, just to emphasise it's open access. So you don't have to buy the book to use this. It's there, it's free, it's for everyone. <laughs> Um, do we want to mention, we've mentioned it already, but there's an additional chapter on teaching, supervising, assessing and examining that, again, it's free, it's open access, anyone can use it. Um, obviously, it's written um, for people who are teaching or supervising, but I think there'd be useful stuff in there for students as well on kind of understanding the supervision process and how you can work with your supervisor effectively and also useful information on kind of how you assess and examine kind of TA as well. So do check that one out. Um, it looks small, but there's an awful lot of material on there. There's a really lovely um, reflective discussion between Nikki and Gareth about researching um, child free women. And they have this really nice kind of reflexive discussion around that process. And so if you want a kind of worked example of reflexivity, I'd have a look at that. And that we chose that because it kind of relates to the topic of the data set that we explore in the book. Um, and there's lots of other bits and bobs in there. It's a treasure trove of information. After we said, we're not doing a companion website, here's this vast companion website that we created. And we also have links to our successful qualitative research companion website, a University of Auckland kind of TA um, website. So it's a one-stop shop for all things Brown and Clark. Yeah, I just add one of the other things, I'm aware that we've got two minutes, but just one of the other things we also have on this, which is a really nice feature, is two chapters, two and other additional chapters where we selected an experiential kind of reflexive TA paper and a more critical and theoretical TA type paper and then we got the authors of those papers to write a reflexive commentary around a, an abridged version of that paper so they kind of reflect on and talk about the different choices the different processes of reflexive TA and I think those are really nice um, learning resources for you to kind of go and have a look at and say just put links to the original papers as well so you can get the whole paper uh, if you want to read it and then you can read the kind of reflexive commented on version. I will stop my screen share now. Okay. I would just say that the um, the more critical um, paper is a re if, if people are interested in deductive reflexive TA and how you do it, the kind of critical paper is a really, really good example of what a deductive reflexive TA looks like in practice, because it's not um, like deductive other kinds of TA. It's quite different. It's using kind of theory as a, an interpretive lens for engaging with data so it's quite a different understanding of what it means to be deductive and that gives a really nice concrete example of what that looks like uh, i think um we are at the end of our allocated um time slot and so i am very sorry to all the people whose questions we didn't um, get time to address, but um, we will be on Twitter. Victoria in particular will be doing some awesome um, Twitter commentary that will connect to some of those questions, no doubt, and I will be doing some excellent retweeting of those <laughs> Twitter comments. Um, but Camille, um, what do we, how do we close this? I guess we, I don't think we talked about that as a process. <laughs> That's okay. Thanks so much, Ginny, Victoria and Gareth and Nikki. It's been such a rich, lively discussion. Um, thank you to all our viewers as well. Um, really fantastic contributions, not just by the Q&A on here, but also by the YouTube live stream. As Ginny and Victoria have said, we haven't been able to get to all your questions, but I'd urge you to follow them both and also Gareth and Nikki on Twitter because there's a real uh, rich variety of um, information that you can get from that as well. Um, I'm going to quickly just share my screen to put up the codes because I understand that the book uh, wasn't working earlier. So I'm just going to do that quickly now. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so just to let you know that we've got 25% off with TA25 globally until the end of the year and Booktopia with TA2021. But thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure and um, 
yeah, we look forward to hearing from you soon. So thank you very much and and good night or <laughs> good morning. Thank you.